stand and say
singing, I can tell you that. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the blessings. Good singing, and I like that old good old singing out of those good old hymn books with the blood in it. Thank you, Lord. Don't forget, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, men and ladies, we will have a prayer wheel. Who does that include? Everybody. If you can come, please be here. We need to be praying for our next year, be praying for our church. One other, a lot of people we need to be praying for. <clears throat> and the good news, Miss Lily Fain should be at home now. She was coming home about 4 o'clock. Stevie called me and said they was on the way home, so she should be home now. And uh, what they had done for her was give her some blood thinner. Some plaque had built up in some of her arteries, and they was give her some blood thinner. I believe it was cumulin, I believe it was, huh? Plavix, okay, which one of the blood thinners anyway to thin her blood. So uh, thank the Lord for blessing her that she's back home. And I know she wants to be back home. <clears throat> we all would like to be home. As I look out upon the congregation tonight, <clears throat> I see several family members with their whole family here with them tonight. You know what? That is a great blessing. That's a great blessing, whoever you might be. Because it won't be long, you won't have them with you. I tell you what, they'll be gone in a hurry, won't they? I'm telling you, they'll be leaving you. And you won't never get them back all at one time together. So it's a blessing you see the families have their family with them tonight. And each time that you worship, Wednesday night is a beautiful time as we see cars drive up on Wednesday night and the whole family gets out. Come to the house of the Lord to worship. There's no greater time than midweek prayer service for your family to be together if they can, to worship together. As I said, next week will be our first Sunday, next Sunday, and our first Sunday in our church year. Lord's Supper, Communion, Sunday night, Wednesday night, conference. As we get going and pray we have a better year next year than we had this year, and each year better. Tonight, Revelation, winding up the church age in a book of Revelation and giving me a break. I've been working double time and half time Sunday morning and Sunday night with these churches. The characteristics of a lukewarm church that Jesus Christ has given us, verses 14 through 22. We now come to the end of the church age that you and I are living in. Things will change. There'll be a change before long. How long is long, I do not know. But this is the end of church age, and you'll find out that the churches across the world, and mostly the United States, you'll find this characteristic of a lukewarm church. And this is the reason that Jesus Christ is going to come back, because of his churches are lukewarm. He's coming back. When I read this last verse of Scripture, verse 22, the last word in that verse of Scripture says churches. You will not see that word anymore in the book of Revelation. The churches will not be here. The very next verse and the very next chapter, the churches will be gone. Jesus Christ will come back, the rapture. No longer here on this earth until after seven-year tribulation 
when Jesus Christ comes back with his church to reign and to rule 1,000 years. 1,000 years. Let's read these verses of Scripture before I get carried away. And I hope I get carried away tonight. We might get carried up. We just don't know any time it could happen. Verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These things say in the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest that I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Jesus said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire that thou mayest be rich with white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that there may not be a shame of their nakedness. Do not appear, and nor the eyes will I salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will supper Sup, have supper with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame, I am set down with my Father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. Let us pray again. Father, we want to thank you and praise you, Lord, for allowing us to have the insight of the Word of God. Not what men thinks, not what preachers thinks, or what you say. Father, it's not even a matter of what we believe, but Father, it's a matter of what you say. We thank you and pray that you are the true one. Lord, you are the one that makes the difference. Help us our understanding. And Father, we just pray tonight that we may not be this lukewarm church, but we might be a Philadelphian church as a priest this morning. We thank you and we praise you for these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I have talked to you about this practical issue, political issue that we have for each one of these churches at the day we're living in today, how they have different problems at different times of the church age. And the practical issue from the time of about 30 AD when Jesus Christ left this earth and Till he's coming back again, we see in these seven churches. The practical manner that we see this, most churches today really have some sort of this characteristic in all seven of these churches. In all seven of these churches. And you personally, as individuals in any church, if it's a Bible believing church, each person makes up a part of this practical issue of the elements in every church. Uh, the churches today, in this church, no bigger than Plato Hill is, we're kind of like a weather map. You ever turn on the weather? I like to watch the weather, especially we have in this, you know, hurricane out there in Texas. You ever watch all that water? Well, I like to watch the weather map all across the United States. And if you'll notice, across the United States, there are always different temperature and different type of weather going on right now all over the United States. In fact, there's different temperature down in Florida. It's kind of hot and it's warm. Midwest, it may be cool. Out there in Texas, we know right now it's wet and it's also hot and it's windy and a flood. California, there may be a fire burning. You know, up there in Washington State, it may be snowing. New York, it may be raining. Well, what we have in this church... <clears throat> And most all churches of any size whatsoever is a weather map of all different types. You'll have some people that's hot for the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll have some people just as cold as ice. And you know what? You'll have some people, they won't care if it's raining, they won't care if the sun's shining. Of all different type of weather is in each church. 
In these seven churches that I described to you through the Word of God, we got elements in our church of all seven of these churches. But most visible that we can see and understand is this last church, the church of Laodicea. That is a church we find out and is the saddest that we have of all these churches. The saddest because we're living in that day of lukewarm churches. Most of the churches today are lukewarm. They don't even know how close they are of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's close because that is one of the greatest signs. The church reflects the atmosphere of the city and also the area around us. Thank you, Lord, that we're in an area really that is better than a lot of areas in our country. Amen? We thank you, Lord, for that. This city was famous for three things. And each one of these cities where the church was founded in all seven of these, always its reflection of these things they were famous for. That's what Jesus Christ had against them. There's three things that it was famous for or things they was doing wrong. One thing, there was a banking exchange city, a very wealthy city where they had the banking exchange, abundance of gold and also of wealth in that city of Laodicea. It was kind of like our Wall Street today, our New York markets, very, very wealthy city. That was one thing, the famous for. It was also famous for their clothing center. There was a particular type of black sheep that they grew, and they had a very, very beautiful wool, very, very expensive. The Laodicean was very interested in the clothing, the adornment of the body, the fashion of the day as we are here in this country. New York, and most places across America today, we are very interested in fashions a whole lot more than we are in the future. But the third thing they had was famous for, <clears throat> they had a medical school there. At that time, there was a lot of people having eye problems. They had invented some type of eye powder that if you would use this eye powder to make a salve out of it, it would cure whatever type of disease they were having at that time for their eyes. Well, Jesus Christ writes this letter to this church. And the three things famous that this city was famous for, he had against this church. Because most of the time, a church takes on the surroundings that it's living in. And they become, you know what, a temperature instead of a thermostat. We'll take on some things around our city and our country area. Jesus Christ had against this church, and he took things it just said it was, and he told them like it was. Now, their problem was they was too blind to see their own need in verse 17. Yet they was famous for Isav. They was too deep to hear the voice of God, verse 20, the knock on the door. Also, they was too rich to know their own poverty, how poor they was in verse 17. They was too comfortable to see their own nakedness in verse 18. These were the problems they was having in, the, in that church. And they didn't even know it, and they didn't even care. Today we have a tendency, we're living in a day whenever a Christian grows cold. I have talked to a lot of preachers across this nation. They tell you that today, the coldness of Christians today, the indifference, the lukewarm, and the relationship to Jesus Christ throughout the churches, no matter what kind of church it is. Call the apostate. That means a turning away. If you can't see the turning away, even in our church, there's something wrong with you. People don't care about worshiping Jesus Christ. We have elements of all type of people in our church. No bigger than our church is. In a larger church, the more elements you have of these seven churches the day that we're living in. In 2 Timothy 3 and 1, it says, This also know that in the last days perilous times shall come. 1 Timothy 4 and 1 says, Some shall depart from the faith. I explained to you several times, the faith is a fundamental faith that they just don't care about anymore. They will depart from this. Now, they had two forms of error. There's two forms of error today in these lukewarm churches, the Laodicean churches, 
and the elements they. They are two forms of error in these last days. They are not local apostate. That means they no longer believe in the Word of God. We are living in that day, in the age that you and I are living in. They do not care or no longer care about the Word of God. There are all type of confusions about this Word of God and all type of translations. Do you all know the homosexuals has them a Bible? There are all type of translations called translations today are not translations. The one thing they all have in common, they cause confusion. We're having it today. But only, not only the doctrinal, people don't care about the Word of God, but also devotional apostate. Matthew 24 and 12 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, that they will turn around. The coldness that we have of some people today, that is devotional. That is worship. Making excuses for some other type of activities in the realm of religion instead of worship. You will find that is unbiblical. The biblical is the more that you worship God, the more you become like God. But we find that this day that we're living in. The last days of church devotion will going to cool off. How would we identify Pleasant Hill Baptist Church tonight? <clears throat> How would you identify this church? Will we be more like the Philadelphian church that I preached this morning, <clears throat> or will we be more like the Laodicean church? You know, Jesus Christ is talking to us about this. What will we say? It's a challenge for us this next year coming, for us to be a Philadelphia church and not a Laodicean church. The indifferent who cares, and lukewarm church of the Laodiceans. Now the complaint that Jesus has there in verse 14 again, and to the angel of the church of the Laodicean write these things, saith the amen. Now the amen, what does that mean, the amen? That means so be it. Jesus Christ is talking, telling it just like it is. People will not heed to the word of God. They want to turn it and twist it the way they want to believe it. But it means so be it. Amen's when someone says amen, that means truly, truly. Aloud, you're saying aloud that I agree with that. That is the truth. Second thing, he's faithful and the true witness. The faithful, he never dilutes his word. Did y'all know that? This word will never, ever, ever change. People will change. Churches will change. But his word will never change. What he said in the beginning, he'll say it in the end. He will never change. He will ne never distort the truth. Jesus Christ is the same. God's word will never change. But Jesus Christ is committed to you and I as Christians this day. He is the beginning of the creation of God. John 1 and 13 says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Everything was made by Jesus Christ. The origin of creation was Jesus Christ. Everything sticks together by the power of Jesus Christ. He upholds all things by his power. Even a grain of sand cannot move without the power of Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says the heavens and the earth will pass away, and it will. But my word will never pass away. My word will never pass away. He is true. He is a true one. 14 again, he says the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. It will never pass away, his word. Concerning the spiritual indifference. Now that's verse 15 and 16 I've already read. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I wish they was cold or hot. So because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Very serious condition, would you say, for a church to get in? 
Would you say so? It's not cold and it's not hot. There's no emotion, no excitement, no enthusiasm today. Would you say we're close to that? Now, people get excited about a lot of things. They get excited about ball. They get excited about all type of sports. Nothing wrong with all that. Man, they can cheer and hoop and holler at all type of ball games. But how about when it comes to church, no excitement? Is it my fault? As I said, I preached on Wednesday night the running of God's Word. <clears throat> and I told you about that when the Olympic game came to the United States up there in Atlanta where they had the torch lit in Greece and they brought it over here and they run from Atlanta down to Miami and they lined the streets cheering that runner on, cheering that runner on, cheering that runner on, go, go, go. Well, that's the way we should be doing the Word of God. We get excited about something like somebody holding a torch in their hand for somebody to play some games. But we get excited about the things of God? Do we really get excited about the things of God? You know, we have a lot of time just about enough religion to make us miserable. God deliver us. If we are a lukewarm church, and you know what? Jesus Christ decides this. God deliver us from a lukewarm church. Now here in this Laodicean, if you read this, especially as much as I've read on the history, you'll find the Laodicean church, they believed in a cross. There was a church, as a lot of churches is today, they believe in a cross, but not enough that it moved, they're moved by the cross. We believe in a cross, but we don't, do we believe enough that it moves us from Sunday morning to Sunday night to Wednesday night, to Tuesday night. We believe in a cross, but not enough that it moves us. Laodicean. Just like the Lord's Supper. They believe the fact of sin, but not enough they care whether people live in sin or not. They wasn't disturbed about it. They believed in hell, but not enough that it broke the heart because people really dying and goes to hell. They believed they needed a soul win, but they had enough of zeal, no love to win people of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you the hardest kind of church to preach to or to deal with is a Laodicean church. And Jesus Christ said, I wish you was hot or I wish you was cold. Either one is better than what you are. Now, I'm not saying this to y'all. I'm just telling you what Jesus said to the Laodicean church. You pull your own application to your own heart and see what condition we are in as a church. If you come to church, fine. If you don't come, that's fine. If someone is saved, that's fine. If somebody not saved, that's fine. If you pass the offering plate, no one puts nothing in, that'd be all right with you. If they fill the offering plates up, that's fine too. Whatever goes on is okay. It's fine. You just really don't get excited about anything. I'm not saying that to you. I'm telling you what Jesus Christ is talking to this church. But Jesus Christ, you know what he said to that church? I will spew you out of my mouth. And that word spew in the King James is a very light word because it's a word that means to make you want to throw up. I know you have weak stomachs. That's exactly what it means. Jesus Christ says, you make me sick on my stomach. Now that's what he's telling this church at Laodicea. You just act like you're at church. There's no care or concern and that's the shape that most churches are in today. There's a lot of activity today, but there's not much salvation today. Lukewarm. Now, you know, most of us, I believe, you know, when you like your coffee hot, you like it hot, you want your, co you want your tea, you want it cold. That's the way I am. Now, I, I don't want my tea cold uh, hot. I want it cold. Well, I remember years ago, and I won't ever forget this, 
my grandmother lived with us, and uh, that was back when I was pretty small. And she would tell me about different people who have stomach problems, and they would go down to Zirkel. Now, there was a special type of water down at Zirkel. I didn't know what kind it was, but they would take mules and wagons. Now, you know, it's, it's seven miles from my house to Patterson. Now, you don't travel seven miles with a mule and wagon very often, I can tell you that. And I don't know how far it is, probably about five more miles on the outside of Patterson. I don't know where all these people come from, but she said they would take mules and wagons and they would go down to Zirkel and they'd fill up whatever containers they have and come back and they'd drink this water and it'd help them make them well and their stomach, have the stomach problems. Well, I thought to myself, that must be one of the best waters in the world. It must be between a Coke cola. You didn't get a Coke very often back in those days, I can tell you that. And they know what a milkshake was. But I said, that must be a cross between a good Coke cola and a milkshake. That must be the best water in the world. I did not know what it was. I never heard of a flowing well. I didn't know what that was. Well, I got old enough. Somebody carried me down to the river. That's down at the river, down there at the river, and went fishing. Well, we went fishing down there, and they said, right over there is that flowing well. Now, back in those days, they had a, had a small town down there called Zirkel. They had a sawmill. In fact, they tell me it was about as big or bigger than Patterson at that time because there was a lot of people moved in the area, and they was, they was really drilling for oil, and they didn't hit no oil, but hit water, and it just flowed up. There was no pump on it, just a pipe coming out of the ground. Anybody, y'all been down there, hadn't you? Y'all been in a Zirkel, that water coming up out of the ground. There's no pump or nothing, just coming up out of the ground. I guess it's still down there, I don't know. Well, I got a chance to go fishing. Somebody carried us fishing down there, and all the fishing I ever done was back at the house walking in the creek. But I got a chance to go to the river fishing. And they said, right, right over there now is that, that flowing well. I said, my, I wanted me a taste of that water. I didn't have a cup, didn't have no, no glass, didn't have nothing, but that water just coming up out of that ground. And I said, well, I'll just stoop over there, and i just get me a big mouthful. And I just looked over there, and I just got me a big mouthful of water that. That was the awfulest stuff I had ever tasted in my life. It smelled like rotten eggs. That was so terrible. Do you know when you got your mouth fixed for something? I mean, you got your mouth, your buds fixed, and it's going to be, you know what it's going to taste like this, and it tastes like something else. Boy, did I ever, I like to made me sick. And it wasn't cold, it wasn't hot, just, just kind of lukewarm come up out of the ground. That was the awfulest tasty stuff that I had ever tasted. How anybody could like suffer water, I do not understand. It like made me sick. Well, Jesus Christ says, you know what? You like suffer water. You just about make me sick, this church of Laodicea. Well, what keeps the church on fire for Jesus Christ? Let me tell you. Staying in the Word of God. Staying in the Word of God. We got to stay in the Word of God. And I tell you, we've got to stay in the worship of God. And it won't do just one once in a while. We need to stay. He was disturbed about their spiritual ignorance. Now, ignorance is not a bad word. It just means they don't know. It don't mean they can't learn, but it just means they don't know in verse 17. Again, because they say that I'm rich, that's their ignorance. I've increased with goods and have need of nothing. See, that was their ignorance. And knoweth not they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They didn't know. He was concerned about that. But here's a church that got to a point. They said, we don't need nothing. A church never gets to that point that it do not need anything. Can you imagine today? Now, there's a lot of churches that call themselves churches it's nothing in the world but social club, and they don't need anything from Jesus. And they call it what they're doing today is a social gospel, which there's no such thing as a social gospel. But they don't have need of anything from Jesus Christ. They're well positioned. They're wealthy. Man, they have money coming in. They have people they have fooled. And they want the preacher to tell them how sweet they are, how nice they are. But Jesus Christ says, I got something to tell you about your spiritual ignorance. You think you're rich. You think you're well clothed. But I'm telling you, he says, you're blind, you're naked, and you have need of me, but you just don't understand it. Because thou sayest that I'm rich, increasing with goods, don't need anything. You see, no time for God. That's exactly what wrong. There was no time for Bible teaching. 
There was no time for Sunday school. There was no time for Wednesday night, for family to gather together on Wednesday night. There was no time for choir. There was no time for the things of God. We don't need anything. We're all right, just like we are. A church, if you told that church that they need a revival, they'd get mad at you. We don't need anything. We're doing quite all right. But a church never gets it made. A person never gets it made. We never get where we're supposed to be. We always need to be climbing. Like I told you uh, this morning, that song they sung this morning, Higher Grounds, that come to me while I was preparing this message, Higher Grounds. That every day we should be climbing on higher ground. And this church, Palette Hill Baptist Church, should be climbing every day, every year on higher ground. Every one of us needs it. Verse 17, it says, you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Jesus Christ said, I want to tell you now, I want to counsel with you now. And verse 18, it says, I want to counsel thee to buy of me gold tried with fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and not thy eyes with eyes that thou mayest see. Now the things he held against him, I'm going to tell you how the to stop this, how to change this. I want to counsel with thee and tell you, buy of gold, try it of me. You see, get off the gold standard and get on the God standard. That's what he's telling you. You know, today we need to do that ourselves. The world standard to think they're rich when they really they poor because they don't have God. Restore the spiritual values, mothers and fathers. Do the things that your children need. And I'll tell you, you need to have them in church on Wednesday night. You need to have them in church on Sunday school, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. You need your children in the house of the Lord. I had a family tell me, I don't bring my kids to Wednesday night. They don't go to Sunday school. And I'll tell you, my children is just as good as any of those down there that goes to church on Wednesday night or Sunday school. Sad, sad, sad mistake. For anyone to think that the harvest has already come in. By that statement, they are saying that a harvest has already come in. My kids are doing just as good as those down there. Sad. The harvest have not come in yet. You will reap what you sow. You will reap more than you sow, but listen. You will reap later than you sow. Sad, sad mistake to think everything is all right now because they're going to need the Holy Spirit of God someday. It might be 20 years. It might be 30. It might be way on down the road. It might be when they're off at college. It might be off, whatever it might be. Let me tell you what they have in Sunday school and what they have on Wednesday night what they have when they're here in church. The Holy Spirit of God, if they're saved, are uh, putting it right here in their head, and the Holy Spirit of God is the one that does the recalling. When I study, it only gives me the recall what I study. Never, never comes to my mind I hadn't already put it there to start with. No children today. The Holy Spirit of God cannot recall when they need the Scriptures on their mind and their heart if they've never studied it. It never comes, to, oh, I didn't know that was in the Bible, and it come to my mind. That never happens. You'll always have to read the Word of God for the Holy Spirit of God have the recall upon your heart and your mind. And that Holy Spirit of God might give you a recall that you have not thought of in 50 years. It will give you a recall when you need it. Jesus said, don't worry what you're going to say. I'll give you the word to say. That's the recall of the Holy Spirit. And without the studying, without being in God's house, at God's appointed time, they will never have the recall 30 years from now, 20 years from now, because they're going to go up against the power of this world. And they're going to need the recall. The recall from the Holy Spirit of God and the word of God this day. Matthew 6 and 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things you're trying to get for your children be added unto you. But you seek the kingdom of God first, restoration of spiritual virtue and spiritual clothing. They were probably sitting in that fine place when that letter was being read to Laodicean. They were probably sitting there with those beautiful garments on. 
that black bull. You know what Jesus Christ said as he looked out from that letter that they read? Jesus Christ bouncing from the pages of that book just like it is this day. You're naked. He's looking out. All those nice clothing. You're naked. You know why? Because they need to be clothed in the righteousness of God. The clothing that they wore, they fashioned it for the world. Jesus said, you know what? You're naked. Return to the spiritual vision that you might see. A blind, physical blind person, you know, can go to heaven, cannot see. Yet if they're physical blind, they can go to heaven. But a spiritual blind person cannot go to heaven. They're blind of the spiritual things and they can't see. They need the vision of the Lord through the miracle birth of Jesus Christ. Born, they might be able to see. Spiritual repentance. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. All right. The church was indifferent, unconcerned, lukewarm, disgusting, Jesus said to me. But he said, I want you to know I love you. I still love you. And because I love you as a child of God, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rebuke you, and I'm going to chasten you. Listen, it's always in a spiritual order. I'm going to rebuke you first. It's always in a spiritual order. God is a God of order. It's never chasten first and then rebuke. It's always rebuke and then chasten. When sin gets in the life of a Christian, gets out of the will of God, a lot of time they'll quit coming to worship or make excuses for not coming, whatever it might be. The first thing that he's going to do, he's going to rebuke you. Now he's got all type of ways to rebuke us. Sometimes it might be in a song that just breaks your heart. Could be. Sometimes it might be in a preaching service. And you know, you say, well, that preacher's preaching right at me. I know people have told me that. I don't, I don't read your mail. I'm not never talking to somebody personally. I'm always talking out. Never talking to somebody personally. I'm talking for the good of everybody. But it may be through preaching. The Holy Spirit might bring rebuke to your heart, song or what it's talking about. And he knows exactly what's wrong with you. It might be in sickness. Might be in difficulties. Might be in circumstances with your family. That your family might be turned upside down. Might be on your job. He's going to get your attention. He's going to rebuke you. All type of ways. For sin in your life. Then if that don't work. He says I will chasten you. You know what that means? I'm going to take you to the woodshed. I'm going to spank you. And he knows where it hurts. I don't know. My daddy didn't do a lot of reading. But I don't know. He must have read this in a book. Because. He had famous whippings. What do you mean? You didn't ever forget them. But he always says, son, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Did your daddy ever tell you all that? Where did he read that at, you reckon? They must have read it in some book or another. I don't know. <laughs> had to. I said, yeah, but it's not going to hurt the same way, is it? It's going to hurt me. You know why God really tells us that? You know, it hurts God. It hurts Jesus to have to chasten us. Y'all know that? It hurts him. Being a dad now, I can understand what my dad meant when he said that. 1 Corinthians 11 and 30. 
for this call, what call to cause a sin in the life of Christians. Many are weak, many have sickness among you, and many sleep. Now that word for sleep is a body sleep. That means death. There's no such thing as soul sleep. When you plant somebody in the graveyard out there, that's body sleep. There'll be a resurrection. There'll be a getting up time. That's the reason they call it sleep. This word here is the word sleep for body sleep, but it's because of death. The soul and spirit is going to be with the Lord. But many are sick among you, and many of you dying, because I have rebuked you and I have chastened you. And what he's saying, I just take you on heaven ahead of time. Be zealous and repent. Come to a boil. And get hot again for Jesus Christ. And uh, you know in old fireplaces you used to have a fire poker. They'd poke that fire and get it hot again. There'd be a few coals fall out there on the hearth and if you don't put them back in you know what? They just cool off. They just get colder. But you know what? You can take old fire and get them roll them back in the right fire. You know what? They'll turn red hot again. You know that? That's what he's telling us. Nobody and no Christian can never get hot for the Lord without coming to a local church and assembling themselves together with God's people. There are no solo Christians. There are no long range of Christians. He says, come together. This is the command of God. We need each other to get warm. I need you, and you need me. When I'm out visiting, that's what I tell people. Maybe hadn't been to church in a while. I said, boy, I tell you, we can really use you. And they always look at me kind of funny when I tell them that. Hadn't been to church in three or four months. I don't know if they ever been. And I say, you know what? Our church really needs you. I mean, they can't understand that. What do you mean you need me? Well, I'm telling them the truth because we need them. Because everybody that comes and assemble themselves together every time we have a meeting, we're stronger. More people that comes, more power that we have. Come. It says, Jesus is calling now. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will have supper with him and him with me. Here's a sad picture. Did you know what Jesus Christ owned this church? Did y'all know that? It don't, belong to, it don't belong to you and it don't belong to me. Jesus Christ on the church. Now here Jesus Christ at the church there lay out of sin and he can't get in. Please let me in. Jesus Christ was excluded from his church. Jesus Christ was used to that because he was excluded from heaven. He left heaven voluntarily and come to this earth. When he came to this earth he was excluded from his own nation of Israel, they would not accept him. He was excluded from his own world that he made. He is lifted up on the cross of Calvary between heaven and between earth. And across America today, you know what Jesus Christ excluded from a lot of areas? It's called churches of that. You know, it's a sad thing tonight across America when Jesus Christ is knocking at the church door and the church doors are locked because there's nobody in there. Excluded. He's knocking. But there's no worship. Verse 21 and 22, To him that overcometh, while I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have also overcame, and sat down with my Father in heaven. But he says there in 20, if you just open the door, I'll come in and have supper with you. You know, in closing, a lot of people this day and time have no idea what supper time means as I do. Supper time has no meaning whatsoever as it did whenever I was a young man coming up. When supper time come, my dad come from another field maybe. Maybe us kids were out doing some other job. And we all gathered up, mama. 
we all gathered up. We had a table called a supper table. That was a time of very meaningful relationship for the family. And we discussed what happened that day and we talked about around the table. As I said, a lot of people don't know what it is because there are no supper tables anymore. TV dinners in the bedroom, fried chicken in the den, pizza somewhere else, tacos here. Let me tell you, we had a supper table. And Jesus Christ said, if you come in, you know what, we'll sit down around the table and we'll have the innocent relationship together if you just open the door. You know, that's what he wants to do tonight, some heart. That's what he wants to do here to this church. He said, you know, if you just open the door, if any man, any person open the door, he said, I'll come in. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. You'll hear that sound no more. Churches, you hear that sound no more. The time is over with. Jesus Christ, the only sound you're going to hear is that trumpet sound. When God the Father on the throne looks over at the Son and gives him a nod of approval, he says, Son, go get them. And that will be the rapture of the church. There will be no more sound of the church here on this earth till after that great tribulation time. This is the last of the Laodiceans. What type of church are we? Personally, what type of Christian are you? Which one of these churches represents your life as your worship to Jesus Christ? Who cares? Don't worry. Philadelphian church, a soul winning church, a, re, a church in revival. Which one represents, or some of these others, represents your life? You see, this is plain for every one of us. Jesus Christ is plain, is he not? And he's telling us the truth. It's up to us. We come with a song of invitation this hour. I've done the best I could with these seven churches. I tried to speak for Jesus Christ. It's what he'd have me to say. Sometimes it makes people mad. I can tell sometimes what I say makes people mad. Sometimes it makes people glad. But it's not for me. I didn't write this book. Jesus Christ is speaking. Has he spoke to you tonight? I hope so. As we sing this beautiful, beautiful hymn, as we stand together. Come follow me. Sweet. 